All right, Acts chapter 17. One of my favorite chapters. This has always been one of my favorite chapters. There's a lot of really neat things happening in this chapter, some good doctrine. Uh, we're going to start in verse number 30. Acts chapter 17, verse number 30. The Bible reads, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And that's the title of my sermon today, is, is The Times of Ignorance. And listen, in America today, we live in some, with some very ignorant people. And listen, the definition of ignorant is not stupid. I know people use the, the slang of ignorant as an insult. But if somebody calls you ignorant, that's okay, because you can repair ignorant. Uh, the definition of ignorant is the lack of knowledge or information. So if you're ignorant of something, there's just a lack of knowledge, there's a lack of information, and you can fix that problem. Yep. Now today in America, we live among the spiritually dead. We live among people that are totally ignorant of God. They're ignorant of God's glory. They're ignorant of God's word and God's judgment. And here he's saying, the times of this ignorance, God winked at. He's like, God kind of overlooked that. God kind of decided not to maybe be as, as strict on that as maybe he is now. Listen, the times of ignorance are past. Now it's time to fix the problem of ignorance, and it starts with the church. In 1 Chronicles 12, he says, of the, he says, And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. We need more men that understand the times to know what the church ought to do. Yeah. right? And it's time to just say, okay, let's forget about the times of ignorance. There are a lot of Christians that are willfully ignorant. They want to be blissful. Ignorance is bliss, right? They want to choose to have a lack of knowledge. They want to put their hand, head in the sand and pretend like there are no problems, that everything's okay. But God's not happy with that. God wants Christians to fix the problem of ignorance in America, in Florida, in Jacksonville, right? We need to fix the problem of ignorance. And there's very few men that have the understanding of the times. And I thank God that there are some here. I thank God that there are Christians across the world. Hey, there are 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal. Okay, we're not the only ones. But we need to do our part. Sure. God wants us to fix the problem of ignorance, of the lack of knowledge, the lack of information, and He's given us a responsibility. We need to preach and teach. Right? That's the Great Commission. Preach the Gospel, teach all things. Right? Get people saved, disciple them, show them how to live as a Christian. In Matthew 16, Jesus said, Oh, hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but can you not discern the signs of the times? He's like, you can check the weather and figure out what's going on, but you're not even paying attention to prophecy being fulfilled before your eyes. Same way in America, we see that there's a bunch of fake Christians and worldly Christians. They're totally ignorant of the times. They're totally ignorant of how close we are marching toward the end times, how wicked America is getting with the laws and the things. And it's like they're just, they're lulled to sleep. The Christians want to be ignorant. They want to be asleep. They, they're willfully ignorant of the problems. Ephesians 5, he says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. It's time we wake up. It's time we wake up. And we got to wake other people up. They're asleep. He says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. You only have a short amount of time in your life. What are you doing with your time? Are you ignorant with your time? Do you have understanding of the times? Are you redeeming your time? Are you cashing your time in for things of spiritual value? That's redeeming your time. That's taking what little bit of time you have and getting something that has eternal value that will last you forever. Yep. Instead, most Americans, they just want to kill time. They want to waste time. Last night after men's preaching night, Brother Ross left out of here and he texted us and he said, be careful, there's some crazy guy out in the middle of the street yelling, you probably shouldn't let the ladies go outside. So Brother Doug and I, we jumped to attention and went outside, well let's see what this is all about. Must be a spectacle, there's a show. 
There was some drunk dope head standing on the side of the road out there, wasting his time, killing his time, killing his brain cells, destroying his life. This guy, it was, it was quite a spectacle, wasn't it? He's like, oh, oh. And he did that. We watched him do that for over five minutes. And we're like, well, we don't want to grab the dog by the ears. Yeah. You know, he's far enough away. He's not really a problem. You know, there's no sense in picking a fight out there. And yet traffic kept coming by and you couldn't really see him. It was wet. It's rainy. It's dark. He's on a corner. Cars were swerving. Cause, and I'm like, okay, look, he's going to get run over. He's going to destroy his own life because he would rather kill time being doped up. I just want to feel a little bit better. Let me just have a little bit of this drug. Well, it's not enough. I need a little more drugs. I just got to take a little more. It's not enough. I need some more. And then all of a sudden, no, no, it's too much. Oh, oh, what am I going to do? I said, hey, get out of the road. Go home. You're going to get killed. And the idiot, I mean, they want to drive. And he gets up, he moves, he goes down the road, stops again. Oh. Listen, that's Christianity in America. They're drunk. Yeah. They're asleep. They're not sober. Sure. They're ignorant of what's going on. This guy almost got killed in the middle of the road. This guy could have, I mean, who knows what he's on? He could have fried his brain last night permanently. He could have got ran over by a car, dead, mm -hmm. wasting his time. Yeah. He's not redeeming the time. And listen, as Christians, we need to take lessons. There, there are a lot of worthless people because of their decisions. I mean, he treats himself like a worthless person, but God loved him. God died for him. God wants that guy to go to heaven. Amen. And most Christians, most people in America, they'll never grow into adults. They'll never get past that stage of taking care of themselves and just doing what they, they're being tossed to and fro. They're not awake. They're asleep spiritually. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at. God's saying, look, this ignorance has to cease. We have to stop this. How are you spending your time? What are you investing your time in? In 1 Corinthians 7, it says, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. Listen, I don't care if you say, I, don't, you know, my, I come from good stock. I probably will live to be 120. Okay, well, guess what? That's short. That's short just compared to millennium, let alone eternity. That is short. Time on earth is so short. And, I mean, kids grow up so fast. You look back, man, I remember when that kid didn't have any hair. Remember, remember this. I remember that. All right, remember when we got married? That was just the other day. Time is passing us by very quickly, and we need to redeem the time, and we need to fix the problem of ignorance. The times of ignorance surround us. Most people are ignorant of what really matters and what they're doing in life. They, they don't care. They don't have goals. We need to help them. Look at, you're in Acts 17. I want you to see this. Look at verse number 21. So what are you spending your time on? Look what they were spending their time on. He says, for the Athenians... And strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or hear some new thing. What did they spend all of their time in? Was it with their family? Raising up a next generation? Was it strengthening their hands for war? Was it learning the Word of God? What was it? Learning some new thing. Look, this is the TV generation that surrounds us. This is the ignorant Facebook generation of Christians that surrounds us. The fake news, the video game playing. Look, there's a kid next door to us, and he leaves his blinds open. He sits, every time I go to take the trash out, there's a window open, and there's a kid there playing a video game. Always. He, I guarantee he's there right now playing a video game. What's he doing with his life? He's looking for some new thing. He's staring off into space. He's trying to entertain his brain. Listen, in the video content, we have to, you know, this is something new to us. I mean, smartphones are a little more than a decade old. This is an interface to get information into your brain, and it's a bottleneck. It's very slow compared to what Google wants to do with your brain, right? It's very slow what the devil wants to do with your brain. They want to pump this information in full speed. But think about, I mean, just video content. It is visually addictive. This is the one of the first generations that have really had to deal with this. And we are addicted to hearing some new thing. 
We are addicted to seeing, why well, a status update. Did you see what so-and-so had for dinner? Did you see that new video? Did you see what came on Netflix last night? There's a new show. Hey, did you see the game? Who cares? What does it matter? That's ignorance of God's things. Yep. Instead, you just want to hear some new thing that some new person comes up with. And listen, people, people actually get physically sick if they're not feeding their eyes the lust of the flesh. Some new thing. Get this new game. And you know, the sad part is, is that there is doctrine in all of this video content. Yep. Well, I just watched the Nature Channel. Well, guess what? They're saying billions and billions of years ago. Right. Yep. That's doctrine. Well, I just watched the cooking show. Yeah, well, guess what? The head chef is a faggot. He's a pervert. <laughs> is that what you want to train your children to watch? Nope. There's doctrine in everything that you look at. You're accepting things. You're being taught things. You're learning things. You're being instructed by the wrong people. Well, I just watch YouTube. Some funny person. Listen, there's doctrine in there. They're telling you things that don't matter. I just watch football. Yeah, what do they tell you? Get drunk, buy a bigger house, buy a faster car, get a new wife. That's doctrine. It's ungodly. Right. The times of that ignorance God's winked at. And he comes to these people. These are the people he's talking to. And he's saying, you people are ignorant. You're always looking for some new thing. Yeah, but there's a new game. There's new, it's faster. There's a new toy. There's new. Forget about it. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter to God. It's time for us to fix the spiritual ignorance in America. Look at the next verse here. Look at verse number 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. The whole city is given to idolatry. So, actually, this is a few verses before that one, but he's saying, Paul is sitting around waiting. He noticed, wait a minute, idols, 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 idols. So these are the people we're going to see in a second are always wanting to see some new thing. Why? Because it's always some new God, some new religion, some new doctrine. So he gets stirred up. Did you see the football game? Did you hear about the football game? Man, going soul winning in this city when the Jacksonville Jaguars are playing football is very difficult. People could care less about the things of God. They're willingly ignorant because they've chosen football. That's not good. That's very dangerous. Look at verse 17. Therefore, so what's Paul doing? He says, Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews, and with devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met with him. So he brought the battle to them. Here's Paul, the apostle, preaching the gospel, evangelizing, converting people. I mean, full guns blazing. He didn't, well, wow, they're all given to idolatry. You better go to the next city. He says, no, we're going to fight this. We're going to fix this. We're going to correct the error here. Let's try to fix this ignorance. Look at verse 18. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, what will this babbler say? Others, some, he seemeth to be a center forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Listen, that's the goal. What do you, how do you fix the ignorance? You preach Jesus and the resurrection. Unfortunately, Americans today, the, it is the strange God. What are you preaching some strange God? Look, I knocked on a guy's t door today. He claimed to be a Christian, but it was a foreign concept to him that salvation was by faith alone. Well, no, I mean, no, you got to do the work. I mean, you, you got to repent of your sin. Think about that. That's foreign. That's strange to most Americans that salvation can be by faith alone. The true gospel is strange to them. It's foreign to them. Look at verse 19. And they took him and brought him unto Aragopas, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things into our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Listen, we have the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the Word of God. And for us to not become like the dead Christians in America, to not be like the worthless, the idolatrous generation around us, when you go on whatever, Facebook, YouTube, Netflix, Hulu, whatever your video content's coming from, and when you go there and you hit that lull and you realize, well, there's no new posts. Well, I've already seen all these shows. I've already seen that video. 
Don't just keep digging. Well, I'll write something different. You, no, get in the Bible. Read the Bible. Strengthen your own doctrine. Disciple yourself through the Word of God. That, that, that's how we fix our own ignorance. And whatever you read, whatever you invest your time in, whatever you redeem your time with, God will let you take that and give it to somebody else. Listen, do you want to help people in the Word? Read something. And when you read it, it goes into the heart, and guess what? It's got to come back out. You're going to tell somebody else. You're going to teach somebody what God showed you in the Word. So that's to be a good discipler, you need to be a good studier. Right? You've got to figure out what God has said. And the more that you read, the more you'll have to give to somebody else. I mean, there's so many times in my life that I would study something, even when just in passing. Well, I'm having a hard time focusing. I'll just read a couple chapters real quick. Right? How should a Christian kill time? I'll just read a few chapters real quick. Whoa! I found a nugget. Oh yeah, I forgot about this story. That's really good. I learned a lesson in here. And then there's something in there you can always share with somebody else. If Christians spent more time doing that, they would be more valuable. They would be more strengthened to the warfare that's out there, the spiritual warfare. They would have verses ready to teach doctrine to other people. So how do we not become like that idolatrous generation? When you hit a lull, when you get on Facebook and it's like, well, no new posts, no new videos, no new articles. Don't just keep digging and go back to a week. No, go, go in the Word. Get off Facebook. Get off YouTube. Get off Hulu, Netflix. Fill in the blank and get in the Word. In Colossians 4, he says, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. How do we help those that are out? Well, we got to have wisdom, redeeming our time. He says, Let your speech always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. How do you answer every man? You get wisdom out of the Word. You study the Bible. We have to redeem our time. We can't waste it. We have to invest our time in spiritual things. We have to make goals in our life. We have to make changes in our life. And if you say, well, I, I don't do but a very little bit of reading, or I'm not reading every day, make a goal. Make a change to fulfill that goal. Make sure your goal is obtainable. Make a goal to say, well, before I go to Facebook or YouTube, I'm at least going to read something out of the Word of God. If we could do that, we would be much better off. We would be able to help more. Amen. In Psalm 89, he says, Remember how short my time is. Wherefore hast thou made all men in vain? He's asking this question, is life pointless? Are we just here for some pointless, vain reason? Or do we have a purpose? Do we have a mission? There are people in here today that got somebody saved by going out preaching the gospel. Do you understand how invaluable that is to that other person that received it? That changed their life. That changed their eternal life. And your time is short. Are you redeeming your time? In James 4 he says, Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then it vanisheth away. Our time on this earth is so short. We need to spend it for things of the glory of God. We need to spend our time preaching the gospel and teaching doctrine. If we would focus on doing that, we could change the ignorance around us. You know, we all have people around us that are ignorant of certain things, and the only way to fix it is to educate them, to instruct them, to give them knowledge, and it's right here. God's already given it to us. What are we doing with it? You're in Acts chapter 17. Look at verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Right? They're too superstitious. Like Paul just grabbed the bull by the horns. Can you imagine? Listen, you're wasting your time. You spend too much time playing games. You spend too much time on Facebook. You spend too much time waiting for a football game. You need to get in church. You need to read the Word of God. You need to be a disciple. Paul was speaking with the, the authority of the Holy Spirit, and he was doing it very boldly. Yeah. And God's extended that authority to us through the Holy Spirit. Look what he says in verse 23. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, which are idols, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. The funny thing about this unknown God, so what's really happening is they've got, we got an idol for this God and that God and this God. Oh no, what if we forgot one? We better put another one up there, right? But you know how many doors have we been to 
Joshua 24, 15. For as me and my house, right, we will serve the Lord. You knock on their door. Are you sure you're going to heaven? Man, I sure hope so. You got the plaque on your wall. What do you think you have to do to go to heaven? Be a good person? I saw your devotion, but you don't know the true God. I saw your angel statue in the front yard. I saw your little praying nun or whatever that thing is, these idols. You don't know God. Yeah. To Americans, the Lord Jesus Christ is that unknown God. Yeah. To American Christians, He's the unknown God. Yes. They say they're Christians. They say they know God, and yet they're, you would present it. Well, here's what He said. Do you believe on the Lord Jesus? Well, you can't just have faith. Yeah. Had a guy today, oh, of course I'm saved. I know for a fact I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. What do we, well, I would tell you what, but you're not going to like it. Didn't he? Well, you're not going to agree with me. Now, when somebody starts out like that, oh, oh, really? Well, tell me anyway. I'm here to ask your opinion. What do you think you have to do to go to heaven? You got to keep the commandments. You got to repent of your sins. You got to be a good boy, he even said at one point. Well, of course it's faith in Jesus, but you got to be a good boy. Or you can't just kill people and still go to heaven. You can't live however you want and go to heaven. But to that guy, the unknown God is the Lord Jesus Christ. He has never made him his Savior. He has never decided to trust in him alone. He's literally trusting in himself. Yeah, yeah but I was raised this way. You don't understand. That's how we always did it. That's what mommy and daddy, they're trusting in themselves to get to heaven. So can I. Had another guy. Well, I've got an insurance policy. And they can do, my kids can do whatever they want with the house. I'm asking about your soul. Yeah, I know. I just, you know, I don't know. Yeah, the unknown God. He doesn't know Jesus. These people claim to be Christians. They'll put plaques on their wall, statues in the yard. They'll even say his name. And they're not trusting in him. They're trusting in their own works. The unknown God in America, that's Jesus. We can fix this ignorance. We can fix this ignorance. Look at verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that He is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worship with man's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. So he goes on preaching Jesus. He's like, these are rocks and stones and sticks. These are not God. You can't make a statue and call that God. He doesn't need anything from you. In fact, he gives you everything. How are we spending our time? What are we spending our time on? These people were focused on false gods on selfish things, the unknown God. They were ignorant. They wanted to hear some new thing. We have to understand about time that time is very short. We have to understand that our opportunities in this life are very short. I drove past the... Somebody had a, one of those fake plants on the side of the road, and as we've been decorating our new building here, I thought, and now that's a good-looking plant. It's, it's, it looks brand new. It's just sitting right there. I better stop. But no, I'll just get it when I come out. When I, when I finish up and I come out, I'll just come back and get it. It's gone. I didn't redeem the time. I didn't take the time, spend the time, invest the time, and get it now. I should have stopped. I should have backed up. Who cares who's watching? Yeah, I'm taking what you call trash. It's okay. It's perfect for it. We just need a little decoration. That would have been great. Instead, I, did, I, I went on by, and that's most Christians. I had several today. Well, not today. When? Why don't, we don't have time. When? When? You need to fix the ignorance and find out who that unknown God is and know the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ or you'll end up in hell. Now listen, it's our job to teach and to preach. We need to educate them and disciple them. Look at verse 26 here. He says, And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. What's he saying? Well, I don't care what color your skin is. We all have the same blood. God is not a racist. God is not a respecter of persons. He says, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Now, these are some strong statements here. He's saying, God has determined the times before. Wait a minute, you're starting to sound like a Calvinist. No, look, God knows the beginning from the end. He knows what your choices will be. He'll never force your choice. And yet... It's saying that God has determined that there's an end day. Each of you have a last day on this earth. Every one of you has a day of the birth and a day of your death. He's already appointed that. He knows what it's going to be. He knows how old you'll be. He knows where you'll be at. We don't know that. Wait, are you saying God is sovereign? 
Yes, I am. Amen. God is sovereign, and He has given us free will to do whatever we want with all this time He's given us. He's given us a short amount of time. What does sovereign mean? He is supreme ruler. Yeah. Hey, He can stop traffic if He wants. He can change a traffic light and save my life if He so pleases. But He's never going to force me to believe on Him. He's never going to force me to sin or tempt me in that way. You see what I'm saying? So God is sovereign, yes, and He's given us the free will, the choice to choose how we invest our time on this earth. Yeah. In the immediate context, the application here, He's talking about judgment. In the end of the world. He's determined the times before appointed. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. I had to tell that to a guy today. And he, I don't, you know, I don't know. And his, and his girlfriend came to the door and ran us off. He didn't know what to say to that, so she, she ran us off. Listen, it's appointed unto everybody to be judged by God. It's appointed unto everybody to answer to God. And there is an end to your life. There is an end to the world. In Exodus 9, he says, The Lord appointed a set time. In Job, he says, Is there not an appointed time to man upon earth? There's a day when you will die, and there's nothing you can do to change it. It may be a result of your choice. God already knows what it is. He's already appointed it. He's allowed it. In Job 14, he says, If a man shall die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my judgment, till my change comes. Even Job knew he would be resurrected. He's saying, once I'm dead, I don't get to come up and do this life again, but I will have a resurrection. Amen. And we, knowing that, need to look forward to that. And we need to look forward to preaching the gospel now. We need to invest our time now. We need to redeem the time now. Because he's saying here that there is a time appointed. Appointed. Appointment. Do you know God has divine appointments? God has appointed times when you will cross certain people's paths, and what you do is your choice. God was so sovereign, Calvinist, He, he moved all the gears of the world to bring you two together at this point, and it's your choice if you'll open your mouth. It's your choice if you'll compel them to believe the gospel, if you'll teach them, if you'll disciple them with doctrine. That's up to you. He's opened the door. You have to choose to walk through it. Right. He has divine appointments for us. Job 14, he says, For now thou numberest my steps. He knows our steps. He knows our sins. He knows our days. And he wants us to invest our time properly. Psalm 90, he says, So teach us to number our days so that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. So how do we fix the times of ignorance? Teach us to number our days. You say, well, I'm 40 years old. Maybe the average guy of my stature might live 80, so maybe I'm halfway through. So if, I, if, you, if, if you said, okay, you've only got so many years. What if somebody said, you've got 10 years left? You've got five years left. What would you change? What would you do differently? Well, you know, I'd probably mend up those relationship problems, and I'd probably focus on getting certain people saved that I've kind of been lax about, and I'd probably quit worrying about entertaining myself visually, and I'd start studying the Word of God and earning rewards now. Right, so we ought to act like we're going to die in a year. Yeah. Right? And have the mentality that we're living for Christ now. What should we do for, with our time? How should we live? How should we spend our days? In 1 Peter 4 he says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. The time of judgment is here. It is right now. It's your choice. Yeah. Choose to judge yourself and you will redeem your time. There's a bigger application in this chapter. Go, you're in Acts 17. Go back to the beginning of the chapter. Again, it's, it's for preaching and teaching. It's for soul winning and discipleship. Go to verse number 1. Now when they had passed through Am Amphibius and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. There was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. That's how we ought to be reasoning out of the Scriptures. It says he was, he was disputing with them. He's reasoning with them. We should compel them. We should persuade them. Oh, well, I don't want to debate with people. Well, Paul did. Is it worth your time? Now, look, don't get in arguments that are a waste of time. You're never going to convince that Seventh-day Adventist that, that insists they have to keep the Sabbath to be saved. Or maybe you'll never convince the, you know, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses that are already out knocking doors. But when you find a Pentecostal that says, well, I think I have to be a good person to go to heaven, dispute with them. Reason with them. That ought to be uh, the manner, the manner of person that you are. Look at verse 3. 
How did he do it? He says, he says, reason with them out of the scriptures at the end of two, verse three, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. He's pointing to the old scriptures and saying these were the promises to come, and Jesus was the Savior. He is the Christ. He's the only way to heaven. Christ means Messiah. That's the Son of God, the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world, the Savior of the world. Forgiveness of sins only comes from Christ. Look at verse number four. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews, look at this, this is an interesting verse, but the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. Now, that's another word for a fag. That's a homo. That's a sodomite. A lewd fellow of the baser sort. This is a sodomite son of the devil. Sons of Belial. That's the same type of people Jezebel used. Yeah. That's the same type of people we're warned about in Judges chapter 19. They're liars. They're quick to falsely accuse. They did the same thing to Stephen in Acts chapter 6 and 7. So he says, certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. All right, so they're trying to run him out of town. They're trying to run him off. They, they're, they're trying to get rid of Paul. They can't find him. They go after this guy, Jason. Right? So what did Paul do? Well, he figured at that point his message wasn't popular. It wasn't really in season. So he just hung up his hat for a little while. He took a little vacation from being a missionary. Is that what he did? No, he kept fighting. He didn't give up. He went to the next city. In fact, Jesus warned us about that. He says, And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake the dust from under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Sodom and Gomorrah was torched with fire and brimstone by God. Jesus Christ burned them because of their wickedness on the earth. And he says the people that reject you when you try to preach the gospel, it's going to be worse for them sure. than it is for Sodom and Gomorrah. This old guy today, the one that, that gave me such a hard time, he, he ends up cussing, like, you go to hell. This guy's in a walker. He's 80 plus years old. He's on his deathbed. This could have been his last chance. And Jesus says, knock the dust off your feet. Right? For a testimony against him. Right. And when he dies and he stands before the Lord Jesus Christ and he recognizes his works won't get him into heaven, mm -hmm. he'll have nothing to say. But God will say, Hey, I sent a couple people to your door because sure. I loved you. I gave you even to the end of your life to hear the truth and you rejected it because you wanted to do it your way. Yeah. That man will be without excuse. Wow. It's sad. It's disheartening. Look at verse number 10. What does Paul do? And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, wait a minute. Thessalonica, they tried to kill him in the synagogue, and now he's going back to the synagogue? Right? What did it say? As his manner was. Saul said, oh, there's people meeting in there because they want to know the name of God. I'm going to go show them who the true God is. There's people in that church. They think they're saved. They think they're Christians. Oh, somebody, hey, you're a Christian? Cool, great. And I tell them, well, I can't let you off the hook. I have to ask you this question. If you're to die today, are you 100% sure you're going to heaven? Whew. Boy, I hope so. Boy, I don't know. Guess what? They're not saved. They're not a Christian. They're not a Baptist. Yeah. We ask anyway. Paul did the same thing. He went right to the synagogues. These were people trying to study and find God. He said, that's the people I'm after. I don't care if they want to kill me. Yeah. That's what happened in Thessalonica. So here he goes into Berea. Look at verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. In that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So you had the, the evil Jews in Thessalonica that got the lewd fellows of a baser sort to go against them. And then you had the Bereans. They received the word of God. They studied the word of God. They wanted to know if this was so. They were noble because of their study. He said, look, I'm going to prove to you that Christ has come. And he quotes a verse and they're like, wait a minute. That's what it says. 
Can you imagine the difference? Versus the others, they just stop their ears. Yeah. No, nope, we don't want Jesus. We don't want anything to do with it. You're, we don't want you here. Yeah. Think about it. Two totally different congregations there. Verse 12. He says, Therefore, many of them believed, also of the honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. Many of them got saved because they took the Scriptures. They got saved in Berea because they searched the Scriptures. They received the Word of God. They were willing to take correction. They want to know the truth, and they know they have the source. They would receive it. Our goal here, the way, to, the way to fix the ignorance, is to preach and to teach with what little bit of time we have. We all only have a little bit of time, and before the end of your life, you're going to have many divine appointments where you can cross paths with people, and first of all, will you find out if they're saved? Secondly, can you teach them the Word of God? Can you disciple them? What if you get a, well, I don't, well what about dinosaurs? Well, i got an answer for that. Do you want to see it? Will you look in the Word of God with me? Well, what about suicide? Hey, there's an answer for that. Do you want to see it? Look, are you ready? Are you preparing yourself for these divine appointments to try to teach the Word of God and disciple people? With what little bit of time we have, that's what God has called us to do. That's how we'll fix the ignorance. Go to verse 27. Acts 17, 27. That they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after Him, and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are His offspring. So here he's preaching. Again, he's just keep preaching the gospel. Look at 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. He's saying it's not okay to be willingly ignorant of the salvation of God. Yeah. That time is past. It's not okay. We have to fix it. It will cost you hell if you don't change your mind about the true God. The Christians in America, as long as Jesus is that own unknown God to them, and the gospel is unknown to them, and they think they have to work their way to heaven, it will cost them hell. They can't be willingly ignorant. They need to repent of that. Look at verse 31. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So, so not everybody's going to receive it. Some will get saved. Are you ready to answer their questions? Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. That's the last place we're going. It's time for us to help fix the ignorance. People need to repent of not knowing the Bible, not knowing the true God, not knowing salvation, and we have to help them. People need to understand they have to turn to Jesus as their Savior while there's breath in their lungs because there's no other way. Amen. Just, just the, the spectrum of people that we saw today out soul winning was mind boggling. Yeah. From one to another it was such, a, such an interesting neighborhood. One guy really was saved. A couple other guys claimed to be Christians and were ready to fight me for saying you can be saved by faith in Jesus alone. What kind of Christian is that? One of them goes to the Baptist church right around the corner here. Ready to, now look, I told you, I, you know, whatever. That's on you. I told him he wasn't saved. It's my job. In Ephesians 5, he said, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. It's time for us to wake up and wake up the sleeping people around us and fix their problem of ignorance. It's time for us to redeem our time and invest it in others. You're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look at verse number 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. 
We talked about this this morning. Hey, you know that God's coming. He said, you know that judgment is on the way. You should not be ignorant of the times around you. We are men with understanding of the times. What are we doing with our time? How are we redeeming the time? Verse 3, for when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day, and we are not of the night nor of darkness. He's saying when all this happens in the times and the seasons that are appointed by God, we are going to know what's going on. Yeah. The unsaved world is clueless. They're in dark. Verse 6, therefore, right, what he's saying, because of that, because you know the time, therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. Listen. People are visually addicted to content. People are always wanting to spend their time hearing some new thing. And because of that, the times are of ignorance. The people, this, these times, the signs of the times are everybody's ignorant of God. To God, He's an unknown God. To the gospel, they don't comprehend salvation by faith alone. They need a preacher to explain that to them. Amen. But the times and seasons, he has no need that he writes unto us. We know what's going on. We understand why the world's going that way. It's because of what they're watching, what they're studying. And we ought to be like the ones in Berea. Be more noble. Studying things out. Accepting the Word of God. Receiving it and giving it to others. Look, without the Word of God, we are all, we're all fools. God's given us the ability to have spiritual wisdom and help other people. He says, so teach us to number our days. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. The goal in your life is to change your life and set a goal to number your days to fix the ignorance around you. And the only way you're going to do that is to change your content that comes into your eyes. If you're visually addicted to YouTube, Facebook, Netflix, you can fix that. It's making you more ignorant of the doctrine of God and it's causing you to believe the doctrines and the lies of the world and of the devil. Sure. You can fix what goes into your mind. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. We can fix the ignorance around us with the knowledge of God. It's our responsibility to preach the gospel and teach doctrine. Let's pray.